Well, hello there. I have a great guest joining me today, a broadcasting legend from NPR. Ray Suarez joins me today to talk about his brand new book, We Are Home, Becoming American in the 21st Century in Oral History. So, so good. You're going to love that conversation if you're the kind of person who doesn't really listen to the news and wants to skip right to the great guest interviews I've got. I always tell you right here at the top when they start. And today, my conversation with Ray Suarez begins at... Just about 21 minutes into the show today. But I do hope you'll stay for the news update. I put a lot of work into it, and I can't do it without your support. So let's get to it. This show is brought to you by you. Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. Hope to see you at tomorrow night's Hangout. Planning to host. Very much looking forward to that. And anytime in the Discord platform, if you are a subscriber. All right, let's get to the news from Earth One, where yesterday was tax day and... Paying your taxes is why we can have nice things. And a giant, giant military, the world's largest, that basically has an insurance company because that's where much of our federal budget at least goes. But you probably paid your local and state as well. I hope you got that done. And I hope you're getting money back. How about it? Well, let's get to what I've gathered for you, the top stories that are the most impactful to you, your community, your country, your planet along the journey here on Earth One. Starting with, of course, the second day of Trump's criminal case in Manhattan, the Stormy Daniels hush money deal on day two of the trial jury selection continued seven jurors were selected yesterday to hear the case against the disgraced former president the picks came after a morning session in which several more potential jurors said they just could not be unbiased underscoring the challenges of seating the panel in manhattan a profoundly democratic borough some of the takeaways from yesterday that the trial is moving unexpectedly quickly the other takeaway from the new york times yesterday is there's trump in the room and then there's trump outside and his behavior is vastly different. Yesterday, the judge in the case, Justice Mershon, was pissed that Trump kept muttering things under his breath and making faces and so on. And he said, I will not have any jurors intimidated in this courtroom. Another takeaway, jurors are telling a lot about themselves and maybe too much. There's occasional laughs, apparently. But the mood inside Justice Mershon's courtroom on Tuesday was tense as lawyers for both sides probed for potential biases or facts that would help them. But there were still humorous moments. Asked whether she knew anyone in the legal field. One prospective juror said that she had dated a lawyer for a while. She then paused before adding, it ended fine. Another prospective juror, a Lower East Side resident, drew laughs with his very New York answer to a question about how he spent his spare time. I have no spare time, he said. And when one potential juror asked if her planned September wedding might be a conflict, Justice Mershon smiled. If we're sitting here in September, that would be a real problem. The judge in the trials presided over the 2022 criminal trial and conviction of Trump organization and some of his executives fining the company the maximum $1.6 million. A 17-year veteran of the court, Justice Mershon has been subject to verbal attacks by the Trump who's also targeted his family. So that's what I've got on day two and some sound coming up, I think. And at another court, the Supreme Court, the justices questioned a law that has been used to charge January 6 riders. This is a pivotal case. I'll try to get to Eric Siegel at some point in the next couple of days. But justices appeared wary during a hearing yesterday of allowing prosecutors to use a federal obstruction law to charge hundreds of riders involved in the Capitol attack on January 6. The justices repeatedly suggested that federal prosecutors may have interpreted the law and acted in 2022 after the collapse of the energy giant Enron to criminalize the destruction of records and obstruction of an official proceeding. They interpret it too broadly, apparently, the conservative justices said. Justice Neil Gorsuch asked the selector general who was defending the use of the law, would a heckler in today's audience qualify? So it was a lot of that absurdity, in my opinion. A decision on the case expected in June. If the court rejects the government's interpretation, it could disrupt the prosecutions of more than 350 people who stormed the Capitol and have been charged under the law. Trump himself would also certainly demand that two of the four federal charges against him be thrown out. But the federal case against Trump was built to survive without the use of the obstructions law, so it will probably not be greatly altered by the Supreme Court's decision. Also, it's unclear how significant an effect any ruling would have in the broader January 6th investigation. Judges and prosecutors working on capital riot cases have quietly adjusted to the potential Supreme Court ruling, and there's currently no defendants facing only the obstruction charge that they might dismiss. All right, let's head to international relations. The Biden administration yesterday announced it's planning to impose new sanctions 
on Iran in the coming days after its attacks on Israel over the weekend. The Treasury Secretary, her name is Janet Yellen, folks. She suggested that the administration was considering ways to further restrict Iranian oil exports. Another Treasury official said the U.S. was looking at ways to cut off Iran's access to military components that it used to build weapons such as the drones it deployed against Israel. So we'll see if that has any effect at all on Iran's ability to continue to make those weapons or have any effect at all off these sanctions don't, unfortunately. And chaos in the House of Representatives. I'll get to that. But first, the news. Speaker Mike Johnson settled on a multi-part plan, passed legislation on aid to Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan and other allies, broken down into three separate pieces that would each be voted on individually. The move aims to allow different factions in the House to register their opposition to pieces of the aid without sinking the entire deal. In order to prevail, Speaker Johnson will need to secure the support of a number of Democrats. That was made especially clear when a second House Republican, Thomas Massey of Kentucky, who is an absolute cracker barrel, cracker jack, crackpot, announced that he would join Marjorie Taylor Greene's bid to oust Johnson from his leadership role. So precedent set by Kevin McCarthy to get the job in the first place continues, and we'll see if they go through with it. Now let's go to the executive branch where the Biden administration is expected as early as this week to deny permission for a mining company to build a 211 mile industrial road through fragile Alaskan wilderness, according to two people familiar with the decision. The decision is a victory for environmentalists in an election year when the president wants to underscore his credentials as a climate leader. The road was essential to reach what is estimated to be a $7.5 billion copper deposit buried under ecologically sensitive land. But the Interior Department found that it would have disturbed wildlife habitat, polluted spawning grounds for salmon and threatened hunting and fishing traditions for more than 30 Alaskan native communities. So congratulations and thank you to the Biden administration's Interior Department for making that decision. I hope some way we can get that much needed copper out of those sacred lands, but it ain't going to be that way and maybe not. Not at all. Well, I guess we can forget about a rate cut, the federal interest rate cut. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell said Tuesday that the U.S. economy, while otherwise strong, has not seen inflation come back to the central bank's goal, pointing to the further unlikelihood that interest rate cuts are in the offing anytime soon. In a long simmering controversy out of Arkansas, legislative auditors in Arkansas found that the purchase last year of a $19,000 lectern, a podium, a podium for $19,000 by Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders' office potentially violated state laws according to a report released yesterday, but the findings may be moot after the state attorney general, Tim Griffin, said last week that state purchasing laws do not apply to the governor or other executive branch officials. So I hope that scandal really destroys her future potential and creates problems for it. I doubt it will, but she should never be there in the first place. And man, what a terrible, terrible mistake that she made and got caught. Let's see what else she's done. That family is so corrupt, the Huckabees. But they come off as so nice. Well, maybe she doesn't. All right. Well, isn't it nice to have a president who releases his tax returns and makes them subject to public scrutiny? Guess what? President Biden, First Lady Jill Biden paid $146,629 in federal income taxes in 2023 after reporting an income of six hundred ninety. $19,000, according to their joint tax return released Monday to mark the federal tax filing deadline. The first couple paid an effective federal tax rate of 23.7%. It marks the 26th year that the Biden has released federal tax returns during his public life. Then President Biden kicked off a three-day tour of Pennsylvania's home state and bashed Trump's tax policies because, of course, he doesn't pay them. Senator Robert Menendez, who is facing bribery charges, may blame his wife now. I read that headline wanted to share it. University of Southern California canceled the graduation speech by its val- valedictorian after pro-Israeli groups objected to her social media posts. National Public Radio NPR suspended an editor who criticized the radio network in an essay, accusing it of a liberal bias. That's an interesting story to follow up on. And federal regulators issued new protections for minors against the type of dust long known to cause deadly lung ailments. That's the government trying to protect the people putting profit over people is what industry so often does. It's government's job to try to fight back. And that seems to be the case that the Mine Safety and Health Administration who issued the rule is trying to do. All right. Those are the top headlines that I've got for you. And now let's get to some of the sound bites, sound clips from yesterday's news cycle. I'll pick some from Earth One and to be sure some from Earth Two. And as always, I'll try to end this news segment and the audio segment on some laughs. 
And let's start with the president, President Joe Biden. He was in Scranton, Pennsylvania, his hometown, and CNN says he was seeking to make a sharp economic argument against former President Donald Trump during a three-day swing through Pennsylvania with campaign officials framing the election as a debate between his kitchen table Scranton outlook and Trump's Mar-a-Lago vision. Well, the trip, which kicked off yesterday in his hometown, childhood hometown of Scranton, also will set up a stark split screen as the president's on the campaign trail while the disgrace former guy spending most of the week in a New York City courtroom for his criminal trial because he paid off a porn star to shut up about having sex with him while his son was like four months old, by the way. He's all upset that he's not going to be able to make it to his son's graduation. Maybe he should have thought of that. He doesn't think of things before he crimes, does he? He always gets away with it, but maybe not this time. Anyway, President Biden's speech yesterday centered heavily on economic populism as he sought to portray Trump as out of touch with Americans' concerns and himself as folksy, scrappy kid from from Scranton, who holds the interests of the average American at heart. That's how CNN wrote it up. Here he is. You can decide if that's what he achieved. You know, people like Donald Trump learn very different lessons. He learned the best way to get rich is inherited. It's not a bad way. I'm not. He learned that paying taxes was something people who work for a living did, not him. He learned that telling people you're fired was something to laugh about. I guess that's how you look at the world when you're in Park Avenue in Mar-a-Lago. But if you grew up in a place like Scranton, nobody handed you anything. You paid your taxes. All right, that's one clip. Uh, Here's another one from Folksy Joe going after elite criminal Trump yesterday in Pennsylvania. I want to cut the federal deficit even more by making big corporations the very wealthy begin to finally pay their fair share. We're not asking anything as unusual. Under my plan, nobody earning less than $400,000 will pay an additional penny. I hope you're all able to make $400,000. I never did. But they're not going to pay an extra penny in federal taxes. That's a promise. Nobody. Not one penny. You know, I have to say, if Trump's stock in the true social, his, his company, drops any lower, he might do better under my tax plan than his. Awesome. There you go. Yeah, that is the president yesterday, and he'll be continuing that, I guess, three days in Pennsylvania. But let's head back to Washington, where is chaos in the House of Representatives. Speaker of the House, Christian Nationalist Mike Johnson, vowing to stay speaker. He will not resign as a second Republican legislator is calling him to the carpet. And yes, they can. This is the way the Wall Street Journal put it. And then I'll bring you the audio. House Speaker Mike Johnson vowed to remain Speaker Tuesday as he faced the most direct challenge to his leadership since taking the gavel last fall, sparked by his effort to pass long-stalled funding for Ukraine, Israel, and other overseas allies. The Louisiana Republican is now trying to maneuver a complicated four-part piece of legislation through the House by the end of the week, like likely relying heavily on Democratic votes while also keeping his job, even as more Republicans indicated they were souring on his leadership. By late in the day, there were signs his plans were unraveling, with members raising concerns about his proposal to pass four separate bills, lash them together, and send them to the Senate. The new threat to Johnson's speakership came Tuesday morning when Representative Thomas Massey, whose face looks like it got stung by a thousand bees every morning, a sharp critic of further aid to Ukraine, said that he will join Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, whose face looks like, well... Marjorie Taylor Greene, on her motion to vacate the chair, which could lead to a vote to oust the Speaker. Taylor Greene filed the motion last month but hasn't moved to force a vote. But Massey, well, he said this yesterday to CNN's Manu Raju. You want him to resign? What yes. Talking- yeah, I asked him to resign. What did he, what did he say? He said he would not. And then I said, well, you're the one who's going to put us into this. Because the motion is going to get called, okay? Does anybody doubt that? The motion will get called. And then he's going to lose more votes than Kevin McCarthy. Oh, this is going to be real fun. This should be a fun time to watch and cry as our government, our federal government, just continues to unravel because of absolute crazy people. And here is Christian Nationalist speaker and man who looks like a real doll, Mike Johnson, answering the question about will he resign? What is what is your response to Republicans who say this move should cost you your job and that if you don't resign, they will try to oust you? Uh, I am not resigning. And it is um, it is. In my view, an absurd notion that someone would bring a vacate motion when we are simply here trying to do our jobs. Um, It is not helpful to the cause. It is not helpful to the country. It does not help 
the House Republicans advance our agenda, which is in the best interest of the American people here, a secure border, uh, sound governance, uh, and it's not helpful to the unity that we have in, in the body. I just don't like hearing him say anything about unity in the body. But that he, uh, there he is, House Speaker Mike Johnson, and he's got to be losing his mind right now, as he should be. He's the leader of the chaotic caucus. There it is. All right, now let's move on to the Democrats and the House, because what are they going to do? Well, here is the chair of the House Democratic Caucus. It's Congressman Pete Aguilar who represents California's 33rd district. Is there a world where, I know this might have sounded strange 10 years ago, but is there a world where if there's a motion to vacate triggered and the votes work out so that Hakeem Jeffries could become speaker, that you all think it would be good to have a Democratic speaker, even with a technical Republican majority? Uh, look, I, I think um, I feel very confident speaking for the Democratic caucus that uh, we want Hakeem Jeffries to be speaker. Um, whether that happens uh, in this calendar year or in January, uh, that's uh, that's the focus. Mathematically, it's it's possible, um, but right now we're just focused on on this week ahead and ensuring that we provide uh, the important support uh, to to Israel, Ukraine, uh, humanitarian assistance for that region, um, as well as uh, priorities in the Pacific. So that's that's the focus and the goal. But um, obviously, from a math perspective, um, we can't rule that out. Um, but uh, it's uh, it's nothing that we're spending a lot of time on right now. All right. Well, there's a little bit more from that press conference yesterday from Congressman Aguilar. Another good question about strategy and how the Democrats are going to handle it. So I thought I'd include that one as well. There's now two House Republicans who are saying they will support a motion to vacate to oust Johnson. Your caucus could hold his fate in your hands. How would you handle a motion to vacate? Uh, we, we don't like the chaos and the dysfunction. Um, we've been down this road before. Um, believe me, I mean, I, I provided a, a lion's share of those nomination speeches. I'm not itching to do that uh, anymore. Um, look, we want this place to work. Uh, we want we want to see uh, aid to Israel, Ukraine, humanitarian assistance, and endopate um, uh, priorities. Uh, that's what we're focused on right now. We can't control the theatrics of Marjorie Taylor Greene and the House Republican Conference, um, but we stand willing to work with anyone who wants to deliver on that help and support. All right. There you go. Pete Aguilar. Yesterday sounds pretty reasonable to me, right? OK. And what else do I have for you here? Oh, this is MSNBC's Joy Reid with a certain framing of the karma or justice that Trump is receiving for his years of being a professional white supremacist. And this went viral. I think it drove a lot of white folks crazy. But I thoroughly enjoyed this commentary from Joy Reid last night that pissed off a lot of the whites, the caucasity. There is something wonderfully poetic about the fact that despite the fact that even if convicted, he's not going to go to prison. The first person to actually criminally prosecute Donald Trump is a black Harvard grad, the very kind of person that his former staff, the people who worked for him, Stephen Miller, et cetera, want to never be at Harvard uh, Law School. But he was. And he came out and graduated. And he's prosecuting you, Donald. And a black woman is doing that same exact thing in Georgia. And a black woman forced you to pay a $175 million fine that's out now also in question because the people who put it up, that might not be legit. Donald Trump is being held to account by the very multicultural, multiracial democracy that he's trying to dismantle. And for me, there's something poetic and actually wonderful about that. It hmm. says something good about our country that we're still capable of having that happen. Go DEI. My DEIs are bringing it home on today. Hmm. My DEIs. Love it, Joy Reid. And now let's end on a lap with Jimmy Kimmel Live, who took a lot of time on Trump's first day in criminal court yesterday, and I'm here for it. All eyes, or at least both of my eyes, were on Lower Manhattan today, where the first criminal trial against Donald Trump is officially underway. It's very crazy that on the Monday after O.J. dies, the Donald Trump trial begins. It's almost like <laughs> that's how it had to be. Like they couldn't exist simultaneously. The trial began at 10 a.m. with the court clerk announcing the people of the state of New York versus Donald J. Trump, followed by 15 minutes of thunderous applause. <laughs> there is a um, 
You know, there's a gag order on Trump. He's not allowed to make inflammatory statements about witnesses, families of the court staff or the case itself. So, of course, on his way into the courtroom this morning, felonious monk immediately violated that order. This is political persecution. This is a persecution like never before. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And again, it's a case that should have never been brought. It's an assault on America. And that's why I'm very proud to be here. This is an assault on our country. He's proud to be there for the assault on our country. He's proud to be at his trial for paying off a porn star. Who wouldn't be proud of that? Gosh, I only wish his parents were alive to see it. God rest their souls. But one thing he is right about is when he says there's never been anything like this, because Donald Trump is the first former U.S. president to be tried for paying hush money to an adult film star who said his penis is shaped like a mushroom. <laughs> Lincoln never did that. Yeah. The trial is expected to last six weeks or until the courtroom sketch artist runs out of orange, whichever comes first. <laughs> because it's criminal trial, Trump's required to be in court every day, four days a week from 9.30 to 4.30. For six weeks, he has to sit quietly the whole time. <laughs> that alone is going to drive him insane. It's like making an eight-year-old to go to six weeks of church. So, of course, he's trying every way he can to get out of it. His son, Barron, is graduating high school on May 17th. He asked the judge to excuse him so he can go to that. And even though the judge hasn't ruled on it yet, Trump is already whining about it as if he did. As you know, my son is graduating from high school, and it looks like the judge will not let me go to the graduation of my son, who's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's a great student. And he's very proud of the fact that he did so well. And I was looking forward for years to have graduation with his mother and father there. And it looks like the judge is going to allow me to escape this scam. It's a scam trial. Yeah, it's a criminal trial. He doesn't seem to understand. <laughs> this scammer judge won't even let me go to graduation for the son who was four months old when I cheated on his mother with the porn star I'm accused of paying off. <laughs> All right, there you go, Kimmel. Very, very funny. And now it's time to get to my guest, and I'm so excited to have him back on the show. He is a longtime journalist and author of several books. He made it to the very top of the game in broadcasting and radio and television. He worked at NPR and PBS. Born and raised in Brooklyn by Puerto Rican parents. Public school kid in New York City. And he really has done it all in television, radio, and print. He also talked and wrote over openly about how at the top of his game he lost his job just like me he was a little bit older and then he actually got and beat cancer it's a crazy story but he is such an amazing guy to be telling it and such a great guest and his new book is real real good and real important it's called we are home becoming american in the 21st century and oral history and just from the description we are a nation of immigrants never more than now in recent decades the numbers have skyrocketed thanks to people coming from many countries especially Asia, Africa, and South America. Just like their predecessors, they face countless obstacles, including political hatred. And yet, just like their predecessors, they work hard, they persist, and they become us. The newest Americans are poorly understood and frequently presented only in stereotypes. Veteran journalist, broadcaster, and interviewer Ray Suarez has crisscrossed the country to speak to a new Americans from all corners of the globe and to record their stories. This portrait of our newest citizens is full of their own compelling voices. It's a story as old as the country, yet each new wave of arrivals tells that classic story in a new and crucially important ways. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Stand Up, the great Ray Suarez. He was publishing a new book, and of course, I said, can I please talk to Ray Suarez? Ray, welcome back. It's great to have you joining me again, and congratulations on your brand new book. Thank you. Great to be with you again. We are home, becoming American in the 21st century, an oral history. So once a journalist, always a journalist, you went all over the country, you talked to people, you wrote a book about what you learn and share it with us. It's invaluable, sir. Tell us about this book and why you wanted to do it. The fun thing, Pete, is that the book is actually quite late. The pandemic slowed up the ability to do on the ground reporting. People were very cautious. They didn't want to see you in person. They weren't comfortable if you were in their shop or, or on their block. So it really slowed things down. And so the book arrives just as immigration is moving 
to the white hot center of our national family argument about this. And really, the timing couldn't be better. That's for sure. So important. Why is it important to if you don't have access to a diverse group of people like I didn't growing up, ethnically diverse, much less religiously uh, diverse? I always thought we were a bunch of white guys with crew cuts who played lacrosse and listened to Dave Matthews and you too. Any questions like that's who we were. We fell in except for the few you know, aberrations here and there, but that's a lot of America, as you know, probably the America that I think so sorely needs to know who the rest of America is, not the other way around. So how does a book like this, I think, teach us who these folks are if we don't know? It's telling you really the America that's coming. In 2010, for the very first time, more kids were born in the country's maternity wards who trace their ancestry to Africa, Asia, and Latin America then to Europe for the first time. Mm. So it's 2024. In September, those kids will be uh, almost all in high school. In 2028, they'll be the entering classes in colleges and universities around the country and the military and the workforce. And at some point in the 2030s, there'll be a majority of the workforce as the overwhelmingly white European descended workforce ages out into retirement in the later years of their lives, and this new American majority uh, takes its place, running the country, making big decisions for all of us. Before I get specific into some of the people you met and introduced us to in your amazing new book, We Are Home, Becoming American in the 21st Century in Oral History, how do you think this is going, this project? And I specifically mean in terms of immigration. I just want to have to get your take because there's been so much talk about it. You've covered the issue your whole career. You've written about it. You know all sides of it. And where we're at right now is we obviously can't get any legislation through on anything regarding immigration, you can pick it up from there. How do you think it's going to get to make this happen in terms of people coming here? Americans on all sides of this question should be really angry about the way things are being managed right now. Mm. The gears of our politics have seized up because of the politicization of the issue. The two sides see benefit in banging the other side over the head with it rather than fixing it. America's immigration system has been periodically retooled, recalibrated every generation or so. It's due, it's way overdue Mm -hmm. for a reformulation, but we can't do it because of the dissension in our elected officials. You know, Americans, as a majority, are saying, yes, find a way to fix this. Give people who've been here a while, regardless of their status, a path to citizenship. Give some sort of permanent solution to the DACA kids so they're not hanging out there in limbo. Fix this. But because of the way politics is done in this country in 2024, we can't fix it. We can only put a Band-Aid on arterial bleeding, and it's really not working. The DACA kids... I always think about whenever I think about the issue, I think about them because it's so it must be so hard to grow up in America and not be seen as American by anybody else. They're they're exactly the same. They came here when they were just very young, before they even knew any other country. It's the only country they know. And yet I think about them often, Ray, and just uh, reminiscing, as you mentioned that, because they're still in limbo and living to some extent in the shadows. I mean, uncertainty is a real horrible thing. and It must be so tough for them. I give them so much credit. You wrote in Chapter 2, it's called Why We Left, How We Came. I feel like this should be necessary reading. Of course, they'd make it illegal in Florida. But this is such an important chapter for every American to read and to hear the stories of why people. Why would you come here? How did you get here? It's so good. Tell me about your approach on this and and, and what you learned. You know, one of the reasons I wrote the book in the first place, Pete, is because I just felt too many people had misconceptions about the whole thing. Right. From the moment that you're sitting somewhere else in the world and decide this is it, I can't take it anymore, I got to go, and America is the place I'm going to try to get into, to the moment that, you know, your own kids 
are born and have big life milestones like graduating high school. So much of our discourse right now uh, revolves around the idea that people very easily, blithely, cavalierly decide to go to the United States and come here for stuff. I, I wish I had a buck for every time people said people come here for free stuff. It drives me around the bend. People come here because their lives are in danger. People come here because their futures are compromised. People come here because in their own country, people like themselves, racial and religious minorities, marginalized people, find they just can't make it. So they do the really hard thing of leaving everything they know, often leaving their families, leaving their hometown, leaving their native language behind and coming to the United States. And they work really, really hard. This free stuff thing is just amazing to me. Yet it persists decade after decade, even when you say, well, I, you know, okay, I understand that you've come to that conclusion that people are coming here for free stuff. You don't get free stuff, even the stuff that other people like you, other workers doing the job you're doing um, qualify for. You often don't qualify for by definition. You're not going to get the free stuff. People leave because of uh, what the law calls a well-founded fear of persecution they leave to reunite with their families. They leave because their educational opportunities are just too poor in the place they're from. They leave because they're in danger. They leave for all kinds of reasons. But leaving your home is really hard. And making a new home somewhere else in the world is also hard. One thing Americans, so well said, Ray, of course, one thing Americans I feel like don't understand because it takes a little bit of nuance and wanted to get your take on it. You listed a lot of the, many of the reasons why someone would leave their country, come to America. But obviously, one of the big reasons is opportunity to work for a job. And a lot has been written and researched and proved. There's a new book out. It's escaping me on, on immigration by the New Yorker reporter. I mean, we know that a lot of folks in countries in Central and South America certainly there's a strong connection to why there aren't great jobs or no jobs or where their job is gone to America's economy and demand and laws. And so sometimes they don't have a job because of things that we did. And then they come to America to get a job that we have and we'd love to have them work at it. And of course, we're demonizing them. Say a, maybe a little bit about why they might not have a job as a result of American policy. There are various uh, barriers to agricultural commodities. There are bar various barriers to manufactured commodities. There was a time when most of the undershirts and underwear in America was being made in Central America. Uh, that manufacturer has moved to all kinds of other places. Uh, the United States has been involved up to our eye teeth in the lives of these countries for over a hundred years. And the people in them have a very strong sense that America has had a lot to say about the place they live, both who's in charge, uh, whether or not they can trade with America, what gets bought and what doesn't get bought under what standards. And then they suffer the downstream effects of that and have to leave. And ironically, where do they go? to the very country that they feel has created their predicament in the first place. Right. Guatemala had finally had a, a normal elected government in the early 1950s. The United States helped engineer a coup in that country. And they didn't have an election there, what we would recognize as a legitimate free and fair election, for decades after that. Yes, the United States is has the luxury of being so big and so rich that our people are unaware of how much we've been involved in the histories of other places. It's an American luxury it is. not to be aware of this. <laughs> uh, it, and it, then you say, well, why are those people here and yeah. why do they want to come here? They want to come here because the place they are is not very good. And we have, we own a little piece of that. We're shareholders in that. Now, you know, that's that's the superpower deal. You're a giant and you get to stomp around the world doing as you wish for your own interests. Americans should spare a little thought 
for the way that we've had a tremendous impact on other countries' histories. It's not the answer to everything. And I don't, I'm not saying blame America. Right. First, I'm not saying that I, either. I'm just yeah. you, you mentioned a lot of the reasons why people come here. And I and I did. And, and I mentioned that one. And even within that one, you include the nuance. I don't think, you know, but but yes, we, we don't know because it's such a luxury. I mean, I have such a great life in most parts of America in terms of what I have access to, including fresh produce in many places that comes from all over America and cheap appliances and products and Wi-Fi and all the comforts that we have in clean water and and all the things that you've seen all over the world as a journalist uh, that people don't have. It really is a luxury for so many of us in America, unlike, and we just don't know. We just don't know it. Um, You write about playing by the rules. There's these arguments all the time. I don't mind if you come to America, if you come legally. I had no problem. Wherever you come from, I don't care. As long as you come legally, you come in, you get a job, you pay your taxes, you don't be a criminal, you don't do things, you know, you contribute to society. I don't think usually people really have that much nuance even just as long as you play by the rules. Ray, what are you talking about? What what do you what do you mean by this? Well, you know, we have the luxury as people who are accidental Americans. I didn't be do anything. To be an American, I came <laughs> screaming and wet into the world on on the day that I did, and I did nothing to have that U.S. citizenship and that U.S. passport. I did nothing to deserve it. It wasn't out of any particular merit or any particular talent. And people who want to be here and over time become part of us, those of us who are accidental Americans, set ourselves up as sort of Judges and gatekeepers. Oh, you can come because I think that you've played by the rules and you've done what you need to do to pass my hazing, my <laughs> my fraternity uh, hazing, and I've worked you over. So now you can come in. But you over here, you haven't done that. Following the rules has become cumbersome, laborious, expensive, and sometimes includes in it uh, bizarre perversities. A lot of people will say, well, I don't mind. And you can come in as long as you go back to where you come from and get online. Well, you know what? There is no line. And if you get on it, it doesn't mean that if you then play by the rules and keep your nose clean, the line gets shorter and shorter. And eventually you're at the front of it. it. Our system is so broken and operating so badly that it just doesn't work that way. I had dinner one night in Southern California with a family that's often just the kind of family that's referred to as a mixed status family. Half the families were members were born in the United States, half in Mexico. One of the older children was born to a man from Mexico. And she's hoping because she just missed the DACA cutoff by literally a few months. She's hoping to get legal through her husband Mm. who has been in the immigration system waiting for his hearing and waiting for his adjudication for 13 years. There's a person with two pathways and neither of them is really open. Right. And all she wants to do is live with her family, live among her family and continue to make a life that she's been making in Orange County, California. Nothing pretty outrageous about that and certainly isn't looking for a handout. But trying to use the system as it is, is just not working out. No, I mean, it, and there are lots of cases. Yeah, like people, it's like you could simplify by, by saying people just want to spend the money that they work hard to make in America and not have to worry about getting kicked out or not qualifying for health care or any number of other benefits that the rest of us get when we make money and spend our money in the economy. They just want to make money and spend money and mind their business like it could be. But that's not what people hear, obviously. Well, yeah. It's also infuriating to a lot of these people to hear the charges that they don't pay taxes. They do pay taxes because they are trying to build a paper trail for themselves in the United States that helps legitimize their their claim to some permanent status. They get free stuff. They don't get free stuff. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the quote unquote free stuff that someone in their same position would qualify for, they don't get. Uh, They are finding that unlike other people who can move, you know, just get on a plane and go to the Dominican Republic for vacation. They can't do that. 
even if you've got DACA protection, you can't leave the country because you likely will not be allowed back in. Right. Because right. if you try to fly back after your vacation is over, guess what? They say, why are we going to let you in? They're not going to let you in. Right. And so um, one of the people I profile in the book, uh, and a trained emergency medical technician from Texas, he makes an okay living. He's a skilled professional. He said, I'd like to go on vacation with my girlfriend, lay out on a beach on some island somewhere. I can't do that. So I have to wait until they finally fix what, in effect, happened when I was seven years old and my mother brought me here. Uh, I couldn't go back to Mexico for my father's funeral because I can't leave the country. It is bewildering, some of this stuff, to the people who are going through it, but they get very little sympathy from their fellow Americans. From far too many, that's for sure. Uh, you talk about religion's role in America and in immigration and I guess what we what we want versus what we we get sometimes because I just want Christians, right? Um, and there's well, a, you know, the, the current uh, increasingly campaign, I see uh, Donald Trump is is overtly campaigning on the idea right. that immigrants should be Christians or like the Christian religion. He says to cheering crowds, if they don't like our religion, they shouldn't be allowed in the country, which is just a strange thing. In, in historical I terms. Want, and I'm not even religious, and I specifically only want Christians because I feel like I can relate more to them, Ray. Uh, but what, what are you telling me and in your, in your journalism and in your work and is uh, that there's a lot of folks that come from all over the world that have a various uh, religion that they follow or none at all. And uh, how is that working out? How is that being received? And how do those folks feel when they come to America? Well, in this new modern era of immigration that really started in 1965 with a rewrite of the immigration laws, until that moment, religion had kind of flown under the radar. Uh, race had effectively been a proxy for religion. Right, right. And since by law, we excluded most Asians from immigrating to the United States or becoming citizens. By the way, something a lot of Americans don't even know that we, by law, forbid Chinese from moving to the country and becoming citizens from 1882 to 1943. We made it very hard for people from other parts of Asia through a 1917 law called the Asiatic Barred Zone Act, which wouldn't allow any Asian migrants to the United States even to become citizens to eventually naturalize. That ended up being uh, a way of limiting religious diversity in the right. United States. Yeah. By 1965, there were almost no Hindus, very few Muslims, very few Buddhists in the country. And what happened after the laws were changed in the mid 60s, people started to come from more different places. So America's religious landscape is being transformed by immigration. The Catholic Church is being kept in the game by immigration because barring Latin American Catholic immigrants to the United States, the Roman Catholic Church would be significantly smaller than it was before the modern age of immigration began, because so many people of European descent have left the church. Uh, what do you what do you make of just the kind of hijacking of the history of America and its founding to convince uh, a whole generation of Americans or voters or whatever you want to refer to them, certainly in the MAGA movement, that America is a Christian nation. And I mean, we I haven't talked with you about this Christian nationalist movement, and I'd love to. But I just want to know what your thoughts are on how that has been kind of rewritten through any number of media resources and, and, and sources and obviously politicians that America, you know, that we, they totally just destroyed American history and why it was founded. And it was only supposed to be Christian. And Jesus was born in St. Louis and he has an AK 47. And that's just the deal. Like, what do you make of that? A lot of people believe that. And that's why folks from all these other religions, which who are everywhere now aren't welcome. You know, George Washington, uh, still revered as one of our greatest presidents, and why not? He helped invent the job. He's a very important guy. He wasn't, how would I put this? Well, he wasn't conventionally 
devout himself. He thought religion was good for a people and good for the country, though he wasn't particularly specific about which religion or how. He thought that it it helped improve the moral fiber and civic grace of a country, that its people would be religious. He was a vestryman in his Episcopal church through much of his adult life, which is one of the lay leaders of his congregation, but he never took communion. (laughs) Why did George Washington never take communion? Very interesting. If you had suggested to Benjamin Franklin that what he was helping to found was a Christian nation, I don't think he would have uh, bought that very, uh, Uh, very enthusiastically. uh, uh, No, I stopped taking communion. Have you tasted it, Ray? (laughs) Well, I take communion every week. Well, have you ever, uh, but have, I don't require that anybody else do so. Have you suggested a dipping sauce? Uh, the, it is. A, we we use one, though during COVID we tried to discourage dipping because <laughs> too many overenthusiastic <laughs> people put their fingers in the cup. Oh, but. man, I love talking to you, Ray. It's so great. I'm so enjoying this book, and I'm so happy that you're the guy who wrote it. Uh, talk to me about uh, the section in the book where – You look at Africans who are now in America as part of the future of America, the 21st century story. Who are they? Where are they from? What do they bring? What are they doing? They they must be. uh, Aren't they from uh, the countries Trump doesn't like? He calls them bad names. You know, the black Americans were uniformly among the most heavily native born of all American populations for most of our history. Right. Because black Americans were in the main brought here as property, brought here in chains. And there wasn't much immigration, voluntary immigration from the countries of the world where black people lived in large numbers. Wow. What a change since 1965. One out of every 10 black people living in the United States is an immigrant. That would be mostly from West Africa and the Caribbean. And one out of five black Americans is either an immigrant or the child of an immigrant. They come from Senegal, Nigeria, Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, uh, Trinidad, and so on. And they have really changed the experience of being a black person in the United States. And it really is a, a redemptive moment, I think, looking at it. As someone who knows a lot of 20th century history, knows that Americans were among the most admired black people on the planet and the most famous black people on the planet. Whether you're talking about uh, Duke Ellington or Joe Lewis or Jackie Robinson, uh, they were known and seen in newsreels, in movie theaters, in West Africa, in Kingston, Jamaica, in, in, um, in the north coast of South America. And yet, also, along with images of Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens and people like that, we eventually saw in newsreels uh, people being beaten by police and having water cannons turned on them and having dogs sicked on them. And the hopeful act of being a black person to move to the United States is something that I think we don't talk about enough. Africans have really made a home here and are doing quite well. Um, Donald Trump laments the fact that Norwegians aren't coming to the United (laughs) States in large numbers anymore, Um, wonders why Nigerians are, and then speculates that it's because they they don't want to move back into their huts. Well, one of the women I profile in my book is one of the leading breast cancer specialists in the United States now, working at the University of Chicago Medical Centers. She moved from Nigeria already as a trained physician, and she has definitely never lived in a hut. Tell me a little bit more about her and some of the other people that you introduce us to, because I think, of course, that's uh, what what makes this book so, so uniquely special. Uh, Funmi Olopade, a wonderful, wonderful woman who I've known for many years, Lived in Chicago since the early 80s. Uh, She and her husband, Shola, moved here from Nigeria to take up fellowships in great American medical institutions, the Mayo Clinic and the University of Chicago. And they originally planned to just be here a couple of years, expand their knowledge, 
train more, and then go back to Nigeria to bring the benefit of that training and enhanced knowledge. And then, you know, life happens. You have kids, you advance in your career, you dig in, you buy a home. And then suddenly, um, Nigeria doesn't seem like such a great place to be after serial coups and economic crises. So you become part of the new place. And that's a big part of the immigrant story. Instead of sojourning in the United States, coming here to make a couple of bucks, maybe earn the down payment on a house back in your hometown, you come here and then, well, stuff changes yeah. and you stay. And uh, people don't realize that this has always been a big part of the American story. Lots of people moved back to Ireland. Lots of people moved back to Italy. As a matter of fact, there was a saying in Italian, he who wants a house crosses the ocean. Um, there was a sense that this could be a circular migration. And then when you get here, well, you know. By the way, I can tell you the, I can tell you the story of, of the Sicilians I know. From my in-laws, it's uh, he who wants to fight over a house stays in in Palermo. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then we'll all fight yeah. over the house. Uh, it's uh, so so intimate the way that you introduce us to uh, a lot of folks and and tell us about their stories. How do you choose who to talk to? I was listening to an interview that you did with somebody in preparation to talk to you again and talked about you talking about your career and, 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 you know, how hard it is to get people to trust you as a journalist. Certainly that couldn't have been easy. I guess, you know, you're Ray Suarez, your reputation speaks pretty well for itself, but that's maybe hard to unleash on some, you know, new immigrant that may not be familiar with your Amazing, legendary career in broadcasting and your books. One et difficult get, Pete, was. Um, I mean, you just walk up and go, Ray Suarez with a microphone and your whole resume. I don't, I don't think that's. Here, I'm already rolling. Uh, no, you know, you can't do that. And, and in right. the case, my editor said, oh, you know, I love this refugee story you have, but we really need somebody of more recent derivation. Can you talk to an Afghan? And I said, oh, well, that's a great idea because right then, was the fall of Afghanistan to mm. the Taliban and all the controversy surrounding the moves of the Biden administration and all the difficulties surrounding getting people who had helped the United States in Afghanistan get out of the country. So then I set about trying to get an extended sit down interview with an Afghan refugee. Boy, it was hard because they're afraid. They still have relatives back in Afghanistan who they're afraid will be abused if they go public with their story. Uh, so I would say, oh, don't worry. I'll change, change your name. name. Yeah. Yeah. I'll change some of the specifics, your hometown, stuff like that. And they were just so gun shy mm. that it took me months until I could finally get this wonderful, wonderful guy who had worked with the American, American military for almost the entire time since the invasion, who's he's waiting for his, a wife and daughter to get out of Afghanistan. And at the time we spoke, he was waiting for his sons to get out of a bordering country that they had escaped to. Lovely, lovely guy. But boy, it was an education seeing just how scared people were. People that I already had an in, a connection, somebody to vouch for me and say, oh, you don't have to worry with this guy. You know, he won't mess you up. He, he won't get you in trouble. Talk to him. A lot of people were really pretty scared. And that that reminded me of something about how precarious this life can feel, especially when you're still just getting started in a new place. Uh, I just can't. I just as you talk and as I've been reading it, it's it's always just so striking to know how foreign this experience is to me and to most Americans and, and most readers that were native born, even if they're, you know, non-white or non-Christian or anything, this is just so, it's so foreign, so unfamiliar. Most people haven't immigrated to another country. And if you did, you most likely didn't do it out of necessarily duress. You might've had to move out of your town or your state or something like that. And you can kind of, I don't know, begin to relate, but it's, it's well, just I've lived in three foreign countries and the privilege of having a press pass or a big institution to yeah. run interference right. for you just makes it so different. I, I thought about that a lot as I was writing about how different my own experience was. Very easy to uh, come in as a fully legal 
a landed migrant with the ability to work, no problems. It, it makes a lot of difference if you've got a U.S. passport in your pocket and somebody willing to go to bat for you. Tell me about Samir from Kenya. Samir, I start the book off, well, well he's pretty close to the top of the book, yeah. in part because his story is so terrific. His mother wins the diversity lottery, which is a little known visa program to bring in new Americans from less, less common places in the world. And he moves from Mombasa, Kenya, uh, just finishing high school and moves to Columbia, Maryland, which is a planned suburb about 40 minutes outside of DC. And to move from this crowded tropical Indian Ocean coastal city in Kenya to this kind of clean, empty, planned development suburb just rocked his world. He said to me, and he kept making these pop culture references, kept referring to movies and television shows. He was totally marinated in American pop culture and thought he knew America because of that. Yeah. And then found out the America that he knew through TV and movies was not the America that he saw on the streets of Columbia, Maryland. Before too long, he was working two full-time jobs, a 40-hour weekly shift at Wawa, the convenience store, and a 40-hour weekly shift doing the breakfast run at McDonald's. So working 80 hours a week, he says, well, you know, when you're 18, you can do that. But it was driving him crazy. So he joins the United States Army. It's a pretty audacious thing after you've been living in the country for all of four months. And he goes to basic training and he says, who do I meet there? More immigrants, people who did what I did, who joined the army just to sort of break the cycle of low wage work and an unclear path forward. He figured that during the army, he'd learn some skills that would help him get a job in the United States after he finished his hitch. So he learned how to be a fuel truck driver and did his basic in the Southern United States. Hmm. And at this point, he's been a quote unquote American. I mean, he moved in like five months earlier and he shipped out to South Korea where they match you with South Korean military units and all these guys who have relatives in the United States, because now there are so many immigrants from Korea in the United States, they would try to pump him for information. Like, what's it like? Tell me what life is like. And he would look at them and say, I don't know what life is like there. I, I didn't really live there. I was only I there for a minute. The cash register at the convenience store, the breakfast window in the drive through at McDonald's, basic training. And now I'm here. I don't really know anything about America. It's an amazing story. And now he's in his 40s and has two young sons, three young sons now himself, and tells them through his experience how they should think about being Americans. And he says that his one of his um, radicalizing, crystallizing, but also Americanizing moments came with Donald Trump's so-called Muslim ban mm. when he tried to bar all immigrants and even visitors um, fellowships from uh, American universities, simply seal off Muslim majority countries to the United States. And he ran down there with his sons and protested with signs at Dulles Airport. Wow. And he started to feel am fully American then, not being in the military, though he says that helped and that he's very grateful for the benefits he got from being in the military. But that was that Americanizing moment, protesting against the government with his sons, holding up an American flag mm. and seeing all around him people who were not Muslims, who were not immigrants from the countries that were now barred from coming to the United States, who felt solidarity with him and came down to Dulles International Airport for that demonstration. You could hear it in his voice, how inspired he was by that and how conscious he was, how aware he was of the fact that you could get in trouble back home in Kenya for 
protesting against the government. It was a really great story. Oh, wow. That is such a great story. And you can read all about it in uh, at the beginning of the book and so much more. I'm trying to think if I ever had an Americanizing moment. I don't know if you did, Ray, but I think if I had to pick, it's probably when I lost the Pinewood Derby. You know, you build the car out of wood in Cub Scouts, Cub to, a Scouts kid, yeah. to a kid and who his dad engineered an actual engine cheating to win and I felt the injustice uh, for the first time in my life right there. And that made me feel American, I think, Ray. You know, I, one of my Americanizing that, moments came on the Via Veneto in Rome. Uh, the American embassy is there. And at the time, Europeans were very upset about Ronald Reagan's plans to put medium range nuclear weapons in Europe, hmm. pointing at the Soviet Union. And one of the biggest anti-American demonstrations in the history of the world marched past that embassy. So I stood in front of my embassy in a foreign country, watched people march and shout their indignation at the United States, and then talk to them after the demonstration was over. And they talked about how much they love America how much they admire America and how much they fear America and mistrust America. And at that very moment, I felt all those fabulous conflicting emotions. I was proud that they didn't try to seal off the embassy to keep away the protesters so nobody would see them and know they were there. I was proud that people just did nothing more than protect the building and protect mm. the plant, physical plant, and didn't try to stop this expression of opposition to an American position. And I was weirdly shocked, fascinated, gratified by how people wrestled with the American in their head. Here I am, I'm talking to Italians and French people and Germans, and they all wrestled with this idea they know that this is a beacon to the rest of the world that this country is an important place in the history of the world and they loved it and they knew it and yet they also weren't sure that they could lay in bed with a giant and not get crushed mm -hmm. if it just kind of rolled over in the that's, middle of the night that's it's, it it's always good to remember how America lives in the heads of people in other places on the planet. Well, if you can learn it to begin with, you say it's always good to remember because you've had so many experiences in so many other foreign lands, but most of us haven't. We have no idea what they think of us and we don't ask and we don't we don't care. And we don't care. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Although we always act like we do in our political fights. They have to fear us. They have to like us. We do care. We obviously care. It obviously matters how we relate to other nations, including, you know, Canada, Mexico, whoever you want to talk. Ray, I could talk to you forever. Obviously, you're one of the best talkers and writers and journalists. I'm so excited about this book. But let me I guess um, if I can ask, ask you two more questions, one of sure. which is. You know, chapter eight, it's looking ahead to the next America. Give us a little preview. People have to get the book and buy the whole thing because it's, it's so, so <laughs> I'm interesting. I'm going to read it to them right now, but oh. I'll, I'll tell you that basically what I'm trying to explain is that if we shut off immigration entirely at this point, if tomorrow we waved a magic wand and said, that's it, no more immigrants, that demographic destiny is still waiting for us out there. That's not going to change. The demographic cake is baked, and we will have a slight majority of Americans who trace their ancestry to Africa, Asia, and Latin America rather than to Europe by some time in the mid-2040s. Okay, so we can, uh, you know, like I say in the game movie, we can make this easy or we can make this hard. And as a country... We can make this easy or we can make it hard. Remember that we will still be us, even when a greater percentage of us have ancestry is in the world where we didn't used to come from. The country will still be essentially what it is. Every person I spoke to said the same thing to me, that they knew that when you got here, you really have to work hard. They know that. They know that the day they arrive, they come to work hard. 
And that makes us a little different from a lot of places on the planet. We have an essentially open field. Once you're in, you're yeah. in and you yeah. can run all over that field. You can move where you want. I was living and working, as you know, in China. You interviewed me while I yeah. was there. Yeah. They yeah. have a system of residential permits. If you move to a place that you're not allowed to live inside the country, you can't take advantage of local government services. You can't send your kids to the local public schools. You have to have that permit to be allowed by the central government to live in a place uh, and in order to have the full chance to be a citizen in that place. That's never been the case here. We just don't operate that way here. And they love that and they fully take advantage of it. And we have benefited tremendously by it. And I try to remind people in the closing chapters of the book that if someone comes here, like Dr. Olopade did, already a physician, we benefit richly right. from the fact that some other place nurtured them, raised them, educated them, trained them. And then who makes all the profit? We do. If somebody spends the most productive years of their working lives here, as opposed to the place that gave them nurture and gave them life, they're not benefiting that other place in the world. They're it's, benefiting yeah. this place. That's a, and a, whether that's Albert Einstein or Enrico <laughs> Fermi uh, or Dr. Olopale or any number of other people, we get the best that the world has to offer because they know that they can do their best work here. If we tinker with that, if we change that, if we mess with that, we will be the losers. And we really, you know, during the Trump administration, they made it harder for students who finished their four year degrees to remain in the United States. And I was pulling my hair out. Right. Who do you want more yeah. than someone who came from we somewhere educated else? Them, we gave them everything and then we're going to go have them go work and live now somewhere. Now go home. Right. Now Ridiculous. go home and build some other place in the world. Yeah, it's, we it's, well, them. it's obviously not a, a strategic move. It's a political move. Um but one thing, you know, do a lot of these foreign countries, they bring the music. I don't love I don't love a lot of it. And they play it very loudly. Ray, what would you say about about my feelings around? Oh, and some, their food is smelly, too. So along. With no, the no, loud I like music, the food. Yeah. I'm not I'm not. Say, listen, sir, I'm not being a bigot. I just don't like the music. <laughs> the food I yeah, love. And, I love, you know, they play it really loud when they're in a public park grilling yes, whatever it is they're grilling. Over yes, there. I would like only. Leonard Skinner uh, at the beach. And now I've been I've, I've been uh, forced to listen to all kinds of different music: Arab, Latin, African. Uh, if there's an Arctic genre, I probably wouldn't like that either. Is all I'm saying. Um, let me ask you finally about your views on things right now. You've seen it all. You've done it all. Uh, and I want to know, and you write a, 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 obviously what Trump represents in, in this book in, in some ways and the movement, but what do you, you know, what, what can you tell me about where, where you think we are here? We're talking at the uh, mid April in uh campaign, you know, Trump is on trial for his first trial and a criminal trial in Manhattan, I should say. And, uh, and here we are. What do you, wh what's the status? Rarely in our history are voters presented with such a stark choice. Mm. You know, in a lot of elections and, you know, you're no kid, you've been voting for a while in a lot of elections, the basic path of the country won't change that much, depending on who wins. Right. When I covered the 1992 election, I interviewed the major candidates and I walked away thinking, all right, you know, I, I'm going to vote for one of them in particular. Uh, but if the other guy wins. All right. You know, the country will still basically be the country. This is one of those situations where the voters are being presented with a really starkly different choice and in immigration more than in most other issues. The former president is campaigning around the country, promising mass deportation by armed and uniformed people. And if you want to turn on the TV at night, and see in your local, late local news, people dragged out of homes and being put in vans, maybe with their kids standing on the lawn and yeah. screaming and crying. That's, you know, that's one possible future. 
The other guy wants to hire more magistrates and more hearing officers and more guards, basically, to to work the border. But he doesn't want to root out the twelve and a half million people who are already here illegally. Incidentally, the average that they've been living here is more than 10 years, Mm. which means they have roots and they have established lives in their communities. You know, it's we are being offered as a people a very, very different outcome. And you may like one outcome more than the other, which is not only your right, but your privilege as an American. Go for it. But it's unlike most other elections where the two candidates were, you know, uh, slightly this way, slightly that way. It's rare. And you can't see because of the framing. My arms are wide apart. They're really offering very different visions of America. And you get to choose one. And because the country, as far as the polls tell us, is very divided, very closely divided. It's not a 60-40 country or even a 55-45 country. It's a 52-48 country. And turnout may have a lot to say about what happens in November. Ray, you have you should win all the awards. You've edu- <laughs> you've educated millions of Americans throughout your career and you continue to do such an excellent top-notch job. You're still at the top of your game, both writing and talking. So good to hear from you and congratulations on this book. I hope everybody goes and gets it. And, uh, you know, when you're done with your initial round or whenever you want, you always have a home here. Come back, join me, take my place, do whatever. You are the best. And I am so privileged and we are to to get to talk to you. Thanks so much. It's going to be a fascinating season and I'll definitely come back and do an election show. With you, you got Thanks it. A lot. Thank you, sir. Oh, man, how about it? Wasn't that great? Isn't Ray Suarez? He's so good at talking, I feel. We are home to become an American in the 21st century, and oral history is out, available. Go get it. Go tweet him. Definitely let him know that you heard him here. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure he will be back. Uh, as he said, he, he's clearly interested. And then once I hit stop, he, he expressed more interest, so we'll get him back, I'm sure. He's great, and I really look up to him, so please let him know that you heard him on the program. That's all I've got for you, my bumblebees, here at the end. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for your paid subscription. I hope you're taking advantage of all the benefits that you get with that paid subscription. I hope to see you tomorrow night if you're listening on Wednesday, the Thursday night hangout. And uh, I love you. I hope you're okay. You're doing all right. Check in anytime you want. You're never alone if you're a member of the stand-up community. And I hope to talk to you, hear from you soon. Bye-bye. John Carroll, one of the best, taking us out. Stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Why you lying awake wondering where the money all went? It'll be the 
cause the freedom never goes fit. You can see him flee the scene of that experiment if you stand up. Stand All right, up. we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside. And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up. 